Welcome back to Voices 2020 for our session on the global economy. I'm delighted to introduce our lineup of experts. In New York, we have Felix Salmon, who is the award-winning chief financial correspondent of Axios and host of the weekly Slate Money podcast. In London, we have Dr. Dambiza Moyo, an expert in macroeconomics and geopolitics, who serves on a number of global corporate boards, including 3M Corporation, Chevron, and Condé Nast. And in Beijing, China, we're joined by Kai Fu Li, chairman and chief executive of Sinovation Ventures, previously president of Google China. Thank you all for joining us today at Voices 2020. Over to you, Felix. Thanks, Imran. This is, this is exciting and incredibly international. I don't think I've ever done an event which has spanned so many time zones, uh, which is apropos, I suppose, because the main thing that you and I and everyone wants to talk about right now is this idea of how the world has split apart and is has fractured into two, possibly even more than two um, main groups. You have China on the one hand is growing basically above capacity, is doing incredibly well, is being incredibly inventive and innovative and um, really sort of showing the way for the rest of the world about how to how to move forward in manufacturing, in healthcare, in AI, you name it, in social media. And then the rest of the world, uh, Dambisa, is kind of just imploding, right? This pandemic has hit us unbelievably hard. Give us a quick sort of tour of the horizon. What, how is everyone who isn't China faring right now? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Imran, um, Business of Fashion. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be on a panel with uh, Kaifu and Felix, who I, I really uh, like a lot and have known for a number of years. So I think what's really important to understand is that even before COVID hit in uh, 2020, the global economy was already in a pretty precarious place. Um, you will recall that we have been really grappling um, as the global economy has continued to try and emerge from the 2008 financial crisis. And maybe just in terms of um, a, a quick um, perspective around the key aspects that are quite worrisome, I would say that there are three things. Um, one is global glo growth was slow, and um, it is slow again because we've had an aggregate demand shock. In other words, we're all sitting at home, um, not in the stores. Um, and that means that global growth is far below the 3% per year number that you need in order to double per capita incomes in a generation. So real contraction. In fact, every single large economy has suffered from a recession in 2020, excluding China, which uh, Kaifu will definitely give us a perspective on. The second big issue that we've been struggling with um, so certainly as economists, but also people involved in business, is that public policy is largely impotent. By that, I mean, we really needed government to throw a ton of money at the problem, which they did um, post-2008 uh, financial crisis, and they've been doing even now, um, but it's basically leaving the um, public policy environment in a very, very dangerous place. A lot of debt um, and a lot of um, a, a sort of new challenges around negative interest rates. Um, I won't get into the, to the technicalities of that, but it is worth noting that um, right now in the United States, about 20 percent of American companies are considered zombies. By that, I mean they have so much debt on their balance sheets that they're not even able to, to use their cash flows to pay um, to pay their, their workers and to pay down their debt. So very risky place. And then the final thing you touched on is really about the trends of deglobalization. Um, we are seeing a contraction in global trade, contraction in investment, in capital flows, in the movement of people, um, really a diminution of international um, integration, international engagement um, as institutions such as the World Bank and IMF are really challenged by Chinese uh, rivals. Um, and that whole world of being interact interactive and trade and capital flows, et cetera, um, has been incredibly challenged over the past 10 years. And obviously with COVID, is even become more challenging in terms of supply chains and how we interact with each other. Um, to very much conclude, uh, you know, in looking forward, what does this tell us? What does this portend for um, the next uh, decade? And really the news, to my mind, is not good. 
um, the, the, the macroeconomic forecasts are pointing right now to certainly um, a rebound in the sense that we are all going to be out, hopefully with the vaccine, and we're just talking about the OECD numbers. Um, there is a story there, which is that we'll get a vaccine and we'll all be able to go out and see our friends um, and, uh, and uh, eat in restaurants. And that will obviously uh, be reverberating the economy and should be a good uh, sort of push for demand. The challenge, though, is that all the things that I talked about earlier, the debts, the issues around climate change, income inequality, massive demographic shifts, um, et cetera, are things that we have not yet got our, our arms around. And in a world where public policy has got a lot of debt, um, it's going to be much harder uh, to address. So let me stop there. I know that sounds very um, bearish, but I will say <laughs> it's, it's that... Um, terrifying. It's terrifying. Well, it, the, the truth is we've been in this situation before. Um, you know, post uh, the 1929 crash, we had 25 years of an economic malaise, high unemployment um, and low growth. And I, I will just that, say that's not I, reassuring, well, Bambi, sir. But we'll get to it because I, I was just going to conclude by saying, um, you know, that people are going to make fortunes. Businesses are going to survive. So we will come to what do you do in this type of an environment? But, you know, suffice it to say it is an incredibly challenged environment. Um, and I think it will continue to do so, be so in the next several years. So, Kaifu, I want to bring you in here because you are living in this sort of world of plenty and growth and innovation. Um, give us a quick like, overview of, of how like, someone in China takes what Dan Bisa has just said and says, wait, how, how do I square this? What, how do I think about that? And, um, and how it looks from like, you know, your perspective. Uh, okay, sure. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, great conference. Uh, yeah, so I've been working in China for a long time, and uh, China, as you know, has had a, a pretty successful recovery uh, from COVID. And a lot of that is due to the uh, pretty strong measures, uh, including contact tracing and things like that, and very strong quarantine. And now I think China's re-emerging. And after one or two months of very difficult time early in the year, February, March, and everything's been going up. And uh, factories are um, running, not even at full capacity, but um, everybody's back at work. Uh, our investments are we're making more than ever. The, um, uh, all aspects of the economy, especially in the healthcare, uh, education, uh, as um, um, in, infused by technology, AI and video conferencing, and everything's going digital. So everything's going extremely well. Probably only offline uh, retail restaurants uh, are maybe down a little, but everything else is, has been very much booming. And, and a lot of this has a lot to do with China being very innovative with digital technologies, beginning with um, uh, the most advanced forms of uh, social network, such as TikTok, uh, payment such as Alipay and financial um, and WeChat Pay. And that has formed the foundation that really closed the loop in China's uh, commerce. And to give you an example, uh, you're all in the fashion industry. So you are used to the traditional way, classical way of design, product development, manufacturing, supply chain, retail, uh, online and offline, marketing, sales, fulfillment, being separate things that are aggregated. What we're seeing in China is all of these are being coalesced into one closed loop, and that's truly phenomenal. Um, and, and that began with people's willing ability to pay by mobile payment. Once you can pay by mobile payment, you can view a TV show, or a, rather a live stream e-commerce show, and, and your favorite um, a celebrity or KOL is talking about all of his or her favorite products and you just click to buy. So that uh, original promise of the interactive TV is live and well. China, believe it or not, has moved 200 billion US dollars worth of merchandise by this method of KOL celebrity um, live streaming. So, and, and also uh, e-commerce actually is having a very tough time. You can see Alibaba stock is not doing that well because e-commerce is being disintermediated. Uh, social networks are, are catching people in front of it, getting people for the impulse buy. The live streaming e-commerce is taking some of the traffic. Um, and then there are also smaller KOLs who are helped by these full supply chain companies that does everything. All you have to do is get followers, then send out um, tweets and then collect money. 
So 300,000 <laughs> small retailers, small KOLs, they're, they're augmenting their income by 20%. But let me conclude by telling you the most amazing thing that I have seen. In the last three and a half years, there emerged a soft drink company. It is now worth $2 billion. This is, you know, and they're the most popular thing in China. The entrepreneur um, is someone who came from a digital internet and gaming background. What he has done is uh, rather than building the product and figure out how to market and sell it, he first figures out how to market and sell it. And then he builds the product that will market and sell the best. In other words, he creates these internet um, uh, content and uh, advertising, and he tries out different celebrities, different channels, different audiences, different brands, different colors, different types of drink, different names wow. of drinks, uh, diet drink, non-diet drink, uh, with milk, without milk. He tries them all, and then he comes to a conclusion, the single drink that will sell the best is X. And it should taste like this, look like this, with this color, sold this way to this people. Then he ask the product people, go make me a million bottles of those. And then he goes and produces the product. Because China's power in supply chain, he can do that within weeks. And then within weeks, he can predict how much of it he's going to sell. So this completely turns around the idea of build a product and market sell it. He markets the product first, then he figures out what to build. So, so this also finally, I think, uh, points out how strong China's supply chain is. So I think this whole idea of decoupling and um, you know, deglobalizing and uh, move supply chain elsewhere is not going to be as easily um, uh, done as, as it is conceived. I think China has strong resilience for domestic supply and also excess uh, factory capacity to, to, uh, to ship globally. So domestic supplies up, global demand, uh, China can elastically deliver that. And the ability to you know, make a million drinks in a couple of, you know, couple of weeks, uh, that kind of capability, uh, I think is very strong. I think the whole world should take advantage of it rather than try to isolate it. Then Bisa, do you think that's likely? Do you think the whole world is going to, it, that China's maybe, I don't know, five years ahead of the rest of us and we're all going to be living in this digital, uh, science fiction world that um, Kai-Fu is in right now, where you have like robots delivering your food every day to your apartment, right? I do. Well, <laughs> I, I, I am optimistic in many respects. I mean, and I think one of the things that Kai-Fu said that's really important is that to the extent that we've seen innovation, um, really, let's just take the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot of progress in areas such as consumerism in, in social networks, but there's enormous um, hope that there'll be real um, technological advancements in, in public goods, education, um, healthcare. I know Kaifu's got some great examples of some of the things that are happening. Um, contact tracing is just one example of how they were able to deploy in an efficient way a system, a technological system that is, you know, leads to telemarketing uh, and in health, but also really um, challenges the status quo. So, you know, fundamentally, I am a big buyer of technology. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about where I think there are opportunities for um, the investments in the future. I think technology is one of them in areas of public policy, but more generally as well. Um, but I, I, and if, if you think about where China is vis-a-vis -vis Europe, I think in many respects, China is in the 1950s, 1960s, in terms of looking ahead and the opportunity for growth. I'm not talking about uh, um, in terms of its, its, of, of its economic development. I'm talking about where you see um, a real important government inter interventions, really important investment in infrastructure, um, in this case, technology. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm very much a big, big time investor vis-a-vis -vis China, I'm very much pro-investment technology. So the question I have for both of you is, is are we going to see a bunch of uh, like non-Chinese companies basically looking at these incredible advances that the kind, the kind of thing that Kaifu was just talking about, um, flipping the whole design and sales model on its head. Um, are we going to see a bunch of Western companies which we can invest in, realize how efficient that is, and go ahead and do it? Or which would be like, I guess, the deglobalization way that everyone has to kind of reinvent this wheel themselves? Or is there still some kind of hope for globalization? you know, moving the other way where inventions made in China, like say TikTok can take over the entire world and remain on some level Chinese. Then we see you first. 
Sure. So maybe I give a little bit of a perspective from um, Western boardrooms, because I happen to serve in a number of Western boardrooms. And I think it's clear to say that for the last 50 years, we've gotten spoiled um, around um, understanding a particular model of how business works. Um, we have tended to build organizations that are based in New York and London, maybe in Silicon Valley, um, but they have subsidiaries around the world. Um, but what that means is how we raised our capital was go to London and New York, low interest rates, borrow in those markets and invest in higher yielding economies like Brazil or South Africa and China, et cetera. Um, how did we hire? We relied on the global pool of talent and we moved people around to run different businesses. How did we think about supply chains? We thought, wait a second, we should go to the low cost provider. I mean, these are things we all know. And what I'm suggesting is largely because of the low growth environment, which is not going away. And in fact, if you look at some of the McKinsey forecasts around equity returns, returns are also materially uh, expected to be down um, for the foreseeable future, more like 4% uh, equity returns as opposed to 8% where they were um, certainly before 2008. Um, and so when you look at the world in that respect, there is a likely, we've seen a big backlash against global markets. Um, we're living through Brexit. Uh, we've seen what's happened with the America First strategy with the United States. So the, the, because there's not an easy economic solution to those political that political discontent, I do worry that there is a bigger pivot towards um, much more insular economies. And what I tell my boardrooms is that we have to prepare for that eventuality. I think it is an eventuality where in terms of trade and commerce, in terms of um, uh, security and cyber issues of uh, capital movements, employment, etc. I think the world is going to be much more fractured and we're not exactly bulletproof um, from, from that risk in terms of how businesses have been run. Um, I would like to think I'm wrong um, and because I am a very much a globalist. I love the idea of globalization and you know low cost producers, et cetera. But I think that's very much textbook um, and it's very hard to implement in, when there's a, a global backlash and in income inequality is where it is. So Kaifu, last word to you. You literally wrote the book on the AI arms race between China and the US basically. Like, and is that just going to intensify now in this era of deglobalization? Are we going to have these two rival powers and um, and very little coming together? Is that the is that the forecast? Well, I think it depends on the American policy, right? The Chinese policy has always been to prefer globalization, but if the American policy uh, require uh, forces this kind of uh, decoupling, then China would respond in kind. So I hope the American policies will change or at least shift a little bit. Uh, but the, to answer your earlier question, what I think whether the two countries or companies collaborate, compete globally or deglobalized, de what is important is that American companies have been the leaders in the world for the last 30 or 40 years in high tech. And Chinese entrepreneurs have always looked to American companies for inspirations and ideas. And now Chinese companies are mature and they're doing great things. Chinese entrepreneurs look at both US and China and integrate the best ideas. So if someone is in Silicon Valley or Europe for that matter, and all they look at is US and they ignore China, then they will be starting out of the gate missing 50% of the nutrients. It's like you know going through uh, school, it's like getting your textbook, only reading the odd pages. So I sure hope some of the ideas I gave will give some ideas to people in the West to start a company like that, because it's probably not likely a Chinese company can take these ideas and go global. Imran, back to, back to you in London. When you, when you started Business of Fashion, were you inspired at all by anything in China, or is that just beginning now, those inspirations? I mean, a lot of my um, early trips to China certainly inspired my understanding about how important this market uh, is, it has become for the industry. And I think, you know, next year, as, as our industry looks ahead, um, you know, more than 50% of consumption in the fashion industry is expected to come from Chinese consumers. So um, once they get back traveling around the world again, I think we'll see the impact of that in Europe and the United States. Uh, but, but Felix, since you did throw it back to me, I do have a couple of questions for all of you, actually, because um, one thing that didn't come up is this new global trade deal 
um, that was revealed, you know, sh not long ago that was led by China. And in a way, it seems like it was uh, a kind of a, a replacement or a kind of response to the, the kind of collapse of the TPP deal that was mooted under uh, President Obama. I mean, what, what do all of you think about, you know, the impact of that deal in terms of kind of China's growing influence in that, in that region? Maybe Dambiza, uh, I don't know if you have a perspective first. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, I, I find uh, China's approach, um, you know, imminently fascinating because it's not just about trade. It's about foreign direct investment. They are leading in terms, in fact, today, China is the largest uh, lender to the emerging market. So it is a multi-pronged approach. I think um, we, we are also seeing the evolution of China um, from being really a low-cost producer that was making trinkets, if I may, you know, I think we used to call it widgets when I was in school, um, to really now much more sophisticated provider of goods and services to the world. There's so many additional dynamics. What does that mean? It means that lower cost producers could be in Vietnam or in, in other places in Asia and across the world. So, you know, do I, 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 it goes back to the heart of the matter. I love the idea of globalization. Um, unfortunately, this is the second time in a hundred years that this whole idea and notion of globalization has really come under challenge. The first time, as I mentioned, was after 1929 financial uh, crash, um, a stock market depression that followed. Um, we had smooth holly, real tariffs and um, imposition of a very aggressive uh, uh, sort of deglobalization then. It cost us 25 years, certainly in the United States, um, 25 years of low economic growth, high unemployment. And we thought we'd learned. So we went gangbusters. We've had great run from 1950 to 2008. I'm afraid now it's not economic. It's not no longer an economic question. It's a political one as far as I can see. Kaifu, uh, go that, ahead, uh, Felix. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just add that this, what you were talking about, this regional comprehensive economic partnership, the one with China in the middle of it, it feels very, it feels more of a balkanization of the world, to be honest. Like you, you, as you say, we had the TPP, which was designed to isolate China, you know, everyone like ganging up against China. Now we have RCEP, which is trying to bring people together with the United States being excluded. And it's always like, you can never have anything with both countries in it. And even RCEP, like right now, there's a major trade war between China and Australia, which are both um, members of this partnership. So. I don't, I don't see, I think that Dambisa is right, that you have this incredibly huge force that is China, which has the ICEP, it has the Belt and Road Initiative, it has all of these different um, components to it. And, and really we are becoming this kind of bipolar world rather than any sort of grand globalization where everyone gets to work on, an, on a level playing field with, with everyone else. Kaifu, is there anything you would add? Um, yeah, I just think this whole idea of deglobalization is um, very, very not well thought out. Uh, the whole world has been built up with these intricate connections, with dependencies, with each country doing what it does best, and therefore it's an efficient system. Now, if you try to force one country out, what will happen is you'll have two ecosystems, both of which are not ideal or efficient, um, and then you will actually, you, you may be trying to stifle a country by pushing it out of the ecosystem. But that country, in order to survive, has to drive for itself technologically self-sufficiency. And secondly, it has to build its own supply chain as a parallel supply chain. And to the extent that country is very good at innovation um, and very good at building its own supply chain, then uh, the initiator will actually be paying the price and the consequence because many of the areas in which it dominated let's say semiconductor operating systems, uh, it's maybe forcing half of the world out. And I think it would be serious consequence and uh, very um, uh, uh, just the opposite of what was intended if, if one does not really begin to rethink this uh, at global scale. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, Felix, Salmon in New York, Dambiza, Moyo in London, Kai Fu Li in Beijing, thank you for your global perspectives on the econo economy in 2021.